please. You can share uh, your screen. Okay, yeah. Uh, one second. Oh, oh. Okay, do you guys see me? See the presentation? Yes, we see the okay, presentation. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a collaboration uh, among many people, but I especially want to acknowledge uh, Andrew King, who took all the data, and Jack Raymond, who did uh, a lot of simulations, as well as uh, Sei Suzuki, Hidotishi, Nishimori, and Daniel Lidar. <coughs> so I want to start by commenting on the title, Coherent Quantum Analytic, and this, this is coherent versus what? It is coherent versus quasi-static. So you can run quantum annealers in two different regimes. Uh, one of them is quasi-static regime, when the annealing time is much larger than uh, thermal relaxation time. And in that case, uh, the system follows thermal equilibrium uh, for most of the annealing. And because of that, because quantum Monte Carlo also can generate uh, thermal uh, equilibrium, therefore quantum Monte Carlo can, can simulate some aspects of quantum annealing, but not all. The opposite regime is, is coherent regime when, when the annealing time is smaller than both relaxation and decoherence time, or dephasing time. And in that case, the system follows Schrodinger dynamics and nothing can simulate. Up to now, there have been several papers published on D-Wave machine, and all of them were in the quasi-static regime. So this is the uh, only uh, the, the first set of data I want to show that that is uh, uh, using co coherent regime in these machines. So let me start by by just giving it a, a little bit of introduction and. Uh, of course, this, this audience are more uh, expert than, than uh, other audience, so I, I will go fast. So the, the problem we consider is, is icing problem. So this is a, a, a cost function, icing cost function, SI are just uh, binary variables that could be plus or minus one. And H and J's are just a bunch of numbers that they're parameters of this cost function. And if you plot the cost function versus the all possibilities of S, then you will get a complex uh, landscape. I cannot represent, uh, visualize a hypercube. I am visualizing it in 1D, but this is, you know, this is not the, the truth. And the, this function can have minima, global minimum and local minimum, and the, the goal is either find the global minimum or one of the, low, the lower energy local minimum. And the easiest algorithm you can think of is greedy descent. You can randomly start somewhere and then follow the gradient and you, with high probability, probability you end up in a local minimum. So this algorithm is, is not very efficient. So unless you, you get lucky and you start in one of these, the, 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 the well that, that takes you to the global minimum, you will end up in a local minimum. And local minimum is an approximate solution. Now, you can think of uh, another algorithm, which is thermal annealing, or simulated annealing, which is, which is a, a simulation of thermal annealing. In this case, you, you, you make a physical system with energy proportional to the I think, I think the problem that I mentioned before. But now I'm using Pauli matrices to, to, to represent the uh, uh, variables. Now, again, the same energy landscape, but now I can introduce temperature. And temperature uh, gives me a energy scale. And if this energy scale is larger than the barrier heights, the system can jump out of the local minimum. And if I reduce temperature gradually, it goes to the global minimum. Another algorithm is quantum annealing, which is the, the focus of this conference. And you all know we add a transverse field to the Hamiltonian with a 
energy scale again uh, the transverse field this is the transverse term and now the this energy scale uh, generates tunneling and superposition and it works as as temperature so instead of thermal fluctuations you have quantum fluctuation now again if this energy scale is bigger than the barrier heights your wave function will be a superposition of all the states and as you anneal and, and reduce gamma the wave function will localize and eventually will localize in the global warming home. this is the I think the best visualization of what's happening in, in uh, quantum energy now the the important question is which one of these algorithms or these two algorithms are faster or but in general whether the quantum annealing algorithm is faster than other classical algorithms one of the early papers that that attempted to answer this co uh, question was Kadowaki Nishimori paper they simulated uh, Schrodinger dynamics and simulated annealing and they, they found that Schrodinger evolution gives you better probability than, than simulated annealing Another relevant paper uh, was by Santaro, uh, again, very early in, in, in 2000. And this time they, they used quantum Monte Carlo to simulate annealing. And as I mentioned, quantum Monte Carlo does not simulate dynamics of quantum annealing, but because if you have a Quasi-static quantum annealing, you follow equilibrium, quantum Monte Carlo also follows equilibrium, there's just some similarities. But the, the reason I'm mentioning this, this uh, work is because, because of two things. First of all, they, this, this plot, they don't focus on best solution, they don't focus on reaching ground state, which is what I want to emphasize at the end of this talk. They focus on, on how the two algorithms, classical annealing and quantum annealing, reduce residual energy as a function of time. And the second thing is you see that quantum annealing have better slope than, than classical annealing. And I want to come back to this at the end of the talk, but uh, for now, ever since 2000, there have been several papers uh, looking at this problem from different angles, adiabatic quantum computation, diabatic quantum computation, many different ways, uh, but what I want to focus is from one particular angle, which is critical phenomena. And again, in, in the uh, 2000s, last decade, it became clear that to those who worked in, in this field, quantum annealing field, that phase transitions are the bottlenecks of annealing. And there are two types of phase transitions, first order phase transition, Second order phase transition, I, I'm referencing a few pioneering works in this uh, area, but what I'm going to focus on is the second order phase transition. And I want to, at the end, leave you with, a, with a, an idea that maybe critical dynamics at the second order phase transition may lead to a, a quantum advantage, okay. some sort of quantum advantage. But for now, let me introduce to you what is second order phase transition in simple language. So I want to use the uh, I think a spin chain, which is the simplest system that has second order quantum phase transition. And so there's a chain of qubits, every circle is a qubit. I'm representing up and down arrows to represent eigenfunctions of plus and minus sigma z because it's easier to visualize this this way. And the Hamiltonian has this particular way. The reason we write it this way because that is what we can run on the uh, hardware. The, the hardware, the coefficients gamma and j have a particular time dependence as a function of s, which is the, the, the normalized time, t divided, t divided by ta, which is annealing time. And at the beginning, gamma is very big, so you have a large transfer field, but J is very small, and at the end, it's the opposite. So now, so now, what happens is, so if J is negative, and you have a ferromagnetic uh, coupling, 
you expect that at the at the beginning of the annealing, where, where J is uh, very large, you have paramagnetic phase, which means every qubit could be up or down with equal probability. And at the end of annealing, with, with the gamma is small, you get uh, a ferromagnetic order. But in the paramagnetic order, basically the probability of being up and down is equal for every qubit, and then every solution is, has z, z to symmetry which is up and down is, is equally probable. When you go to the end of annealing, you either get up or down, not both. So therefore, this, the solution you get does not have Z2 symmetry. It's broken Z2 symmetry. But while the Hamiltonian still has Z2 symmetry, and this is called a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And whenever you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, you should expect a, a quantum phase transition, a, a phase transition. Second order phase energy. Now, but let's let's walk through this this phase transition and see what happens in detail. So in the so on the right, I, I'm showing where we are in the annealing by, by this green line. And at the beginning, where gamma is large, you are in the paramagnetic phase, and every qubit could be, as I mentioned, up or down. But every qubit could be up and down, independent of the neighbors, their neighbors. I will call it, uh, and when, when you have quantum tunneling, every qubit could tunnel up and down, independent of neighbors. And I call it uh, uncorrelated quantum fluctuation. If this is thermal, this is, this is thermal fluctuation. As I anneal further and get closer to the critical point, and critical point is where these two, two blue, and, blue and red line cross, Coupling between qubits becomes stronger, and then qubits cannot easily tunnel independently. They basically tunnel together. They fluctuate together, and the, the size of the region that they, they fluctuate together is, defines the correlation length. As we move forward towards the, the critical point, correlation length grows, and grows further and further, and at the critical point, correlation length goes to the whole size of the system, or infinity, if you have infinite size system. But if you go after uh, the critical point, so here you have this, you see I, I'm, I'm representing both down and up, so there's no symmetry breaking yet, but as you go further, there's a symmetry breaking, so up is preferred, or down, I'm choosing up, but the system is not completely ordered yet. So you, there are a region of the system, regions of the system that are still fluctuate. And the size of the fluctuations, again, define correlation, like not, not the size of the order, the size of, of the fluctuations. And as you go further and further, this size shrinks and eventually you get an order phase. So, but you see that the size of the correlation length depends on how close you are to this critical point. And critical point is right when the, these two lines cross. And uh, indeed, they have a, a very uh, a specific dependence, polynomial dependence, with a, a, a specific power or, or exponent called critical exponent. And these are universal exponents, which means the, the exponent does not depend on the, the details of Hamilton. And many different systems could have very different Hamiltonians. Okay. I have and have exactly the same exponents. So another important aspect is time. As the length of correlation then grows, as I mentioned, the, these qubits that are correlated should fluctuate together, should tunnel together, or if there's thermal fluctuation, should thermally fluctuate together. And there's a time scale associated with that, and you expect that. The larger the number of the qubits, there's, there's more mass, there's more number of qubits that should tunnel together, fluctuate together. The time scale grows and becomes slower and slower. And on the right, I, I'm showing time, response time, some, sometimes called relaxation time, but I'm keeping relaxation for thermal relaxation because this is not thermal. This is, this is, this is critical relaxation. So now, you see, the relaxation time also grows as you get closer, closer to the critical point because correlation length grows. And again, there is a, a 
a polynomial dependence, parallel dependence between relaxation time, response time, and correlation length, and a specific exponent called dynamic critical exponent. Again, this is a, also a universal exponent. Now, if the annealing time is finite, there comes a point that the response time becomes larger than the annealing time. And as a result, the system does not have time to relax anymore, to, to respond to the, to the change anymore. And because of that, correlation length cannot grow fast, larger than some length. And this is called kibble zurich correlation length. It's called kibble zurich mechanism. So if I anneal further than this point, you see that nothing happens. And the system frees. And in the end, you get this, this domain in the opposite direction of the rest and the, the kinks in between this domain. And you would expect again that this, the length of this domain or correlation length, Kirchhoff's correlation length, depend on annealing time because the larger the annealing time, the more allow you allow the system to grow with, with its correlation length. And again, that's also true. Another power law, so the critical dynamics, critical phenomena is all about these power laws. And the, this exponent is called kibel zurich exponent. And it depends on the, the, the previous two exponents that I mentioned before, z and nu that I, I mentioned before. You can think of like it as, as a, a correlation length, or you can think of it in terms of the kinks. And the density of kinks is, is inverse of correlation length. The larger the correlation length, the, the, the smaller the number of kinks that you would get. So again, the, the, the kink density would go as annealing time to the power of one minus, uh, the minus one over mu, which mu is the, the kibel zurich exponent. Okay, now our goal in this experiment that I'm going to show you was to, to test these, these things. And instead of looking at, at uh, uh, a chain we looked at a loop, a, a ring of qubits. This is a 2,000 qubits organized in a, a loop, in a, in a ring. And we ran it in, with the, in this figure is just the, the one round run at uh, 4.8 nanoseconds and 49 nanoseconds. And the two colors represent up and down, a spin up and down. And you see that when you have annealing time of 4.8 nanoseconds, there are, they, they get many, many kinks. So, so every, every region that you change color is a kink. And the, this, the, the length of these ordered phases, uh, ordered, ordered regions, domains, are very short. And on average, if you average over all of these, we get something like an order of 15 qubit uh, domains. If you increase the annealing time 10 times to 49 nanoseconds. Now, now you, you see visually that the domains grow and then you get a lot less kinks. But you see I increase the annealing time by a factor of 10, correlation length increased by a factor of three. And, and three is the square root of 10, or, or approximately the square root of 10. And this is not a coincidence. Uh, if you go back to the formula I showed you before, that kink density is 1 over correlation length, and correlation length goes as annealing time to the power of one o minus 1 over uh, mu, the, the kibel zurich These exponents, z and nu, are known for 1D spin chain, quantum spin chain. And they're both 1. And if I put 1 into this equation, I get 2, and then I get the square root 2. So the, this square root that I showed here is exactly what you would expect using this, this uh, critical phenomena, knowledge of critical phenomena. But you could do it differently. You could actually, this is the 1D chain, a spin chain is an exactly solvable problem. Like you could solve the problem exactly, and this is the formula. You get an analytical solution, which not only gives you the exponent in agreement with what you, what you would expect from critical phenomena, it also gives you a prefactor. So the, the prefactor you would never get from critical phenomena. They only give you the exponent. But it always gives you an exact prefactor. And the prefactor is a complex 
the function of the schedule. So you, you remember gamma and, uh, and j was a schedule, so it's a complex function of gamma and j and their derivatives. And if I put these numbers into this equation and plot it versus experimental data, I get this with no free parameters. So this is the experimental data. The symbols are experimental data at two values of j and different temperatures. These are temperatures. And the green lines are coherent annealing solutions with no free parameter. And they're right on top of each other for both values. And it's not just these two. We, we measured at different values of j, and all of them you get the same uh, level of agreement. But you see, they agree up to some point, and this agreement is independent of temperature, so it, it, it confirms that the system is not, does not depend on thermal environment. The system is independent of thermal environment, which, which, which confirms it, is, which agrees that it is coherent. But as you increase temperature, you see that the number of kinks grow compared to the coherent annealing, and the more the temperature, the larger the temperature, the more deviation you get, and you would expect that because you, you, temperature can also cre create excitations and generate kinks. And for a small j, actually, it, it, it changes the slope of the, 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 the uh, function. So at, you would expect as you increase annealing time, the number of kinks go down, you get closer to the ground state, but it goes the opposite. At some point, it goes up, and this is called anti cubic Zurich uh, behavior. It's just purely due to thermal uh, excitations. And there was actually a paper, 2020, which is uh, Bendo et al., uh, which they did it numerically and they, they predicted that. Now, the average kink density is not the only thing you can calculate or extract from experimental data. You can go further, you can look at other uh, uh, moments. So this is a, the, the first moment, second moment, three moment, and uh, the, uh, it is a uh, the cumulants, first cumulant, second cumulant, and three cumulants, uh, third cumulant. And again, theoretically, these are not independent, and there's some, some relation between them. You can prove that. And on the right, again, we have experimental data with theoretical lines with no free parameters. So it's not only the average, which is the top line, agrees, but also the second cumulant and third cumulant also agree pretty well with the experimental data. Another thing you can look at is, is kinking. So this is, that, this is up to now, it is what was a single point statistics, now you can look at two points in statistics, kink-kink correlation, which is defined by this correlation link. And now we see that experimental data and exact solution, there's a little bit difference. So although they, the qualitative are the same, there's a peak, but experimental result at the peak is smaller than exact solution. So in order to, 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 to get something similar to experiment, we had to add some disorder. So this is the result of a uh, uh, tensor network uh, with disorder, added disorder. And it again, almost qualitatively and, and quantitatively agree with experimental data. Now, <clears throat> you could also do something else. You could also turn the system, move the system toward adiabatic limit by, by reducing the size. If you reduce the size, the gap grows, the minimum gap grows, and at some point the minimum gap becomes large enough that the expected, uh, the, the, the average kink becomes exponential, one minus the ground state property becomes exponential. So the, it goes from polynomial dependence to exponential dependence. And again, you can use exact solutions and see that uh, average kink 
there's an exact solution that that average change here the has to have this exponent a and the, and and the, the dependence on the length of the chain with the again the coefficient b that we had before and so on the right you see that uh, you see the, the uh, two chains of j 0 0.95 and uh, minus 0 0.95 ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic and now we are plotting basically n bar or 1 minus ground state probability versus time but in in log linear except other than uh, instead of log log which it was before and uh, having a linear dependence in this plot means exponential dependence and you see that all of them are like very good agreement with exponential dependence as you expect from Landau Zinner formula and if you extract the exponent from this graph and plot it versus the exact solution that is this, this formula for different values of j again with no free parameters you get these, these results so we get, we get very nice agreement so now for 1d chain everything seems to be the, the in agreement but now you can take a step further and go to to larger systems and this is now uh sorry sorry you can i want to go go back to, to the original uh, uh question which was which was residual energy and the goal of the annealing annealing was that to reduce residual energy to find a solution that has small energy and you can you can also for 1d chain it's easy you can calculate the residual energy as a, as a function and link time because every kink has a cost of 2j and you can calculate the number of kinks based on the total number of qubits times the, the, number, the, the kink density and we know kink density goes as t to the minus one half Therefore, residual energy should go at t to the minus one half. This is just easy, but you can take this, this because this is only holds for for one uh, D chain. But you can take it further and use knowledge of critical phenomena again. So those people who are experts in critical phenomena can tell us how this exponent of residual energy can be related to other exponents. And this, uh, again, I should acknowledge Anders uh, Sandwich, who uh, collaborated with us. And the way this exponent is related is it is again related to the, the z plus 1 over nu, which was the kibel zurich exponent, but the numerator has a ds, which is a dimension. For classical, it is d, the spatial dimension. For quantum, it's d plus z, a space plus time. So, so therefore, this formula is not just for 1D, it's for, for any system that goes through critical dynamics, second order phase transition, and also not just for classical, also for, uh, for quantum, but also for classical. If I put this, the, these numbers from what I know in 1D, which is all of them are 1, I would get again 1 half. So, so, so this formula agrees very well with this simple uh, intuitive calculation of the number of chains. But I can take it further to, to 2D and 3D and ask whether I get a larger exponent if I use a, a, a 2D system, uh, the, I use a quantum system or a classical system. And if the quantum happens to have a larger, larger x, that means quantum have larger slope. So I, I, I want to go back to the plot that I mentioned at the beginning, I showed at the beginning, uh, uh, which was the Santoros paper. So you see here quantum has larger exponent than, than, than uh, classical. So if that happens, you, that, that here, If, if that happens also the, the 
to be the case. Let me show. I'm sorry. Yeah, if that happens, that, that, that uh, we, we see this x quantum is bigger than x classical, then you have a theoretical, a theoretical support for, for that behavior. I want to end here and, and invite you to listen to Andrew King's uh, uh, talk tomorrow, who will show the experimental results that, 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 that answer this question. So with that, I want to end. Uh, I hope I convinced you that we can uh, do annealing faster than decoherence time. Uh, then, and with that, we can do coherent annealing and study quantum phase transitions. I showed experimental results 1D chain, which agree very well with exact analytical solutions with no free parameters. And I had an, a, an argument, high level argument, that theoretical phenomena may tell you that there, there should be a quantum advantage in, in reducing residual energy. I'm, I'm emphasizing this is really the reduction of residual energy. It's not reaching the, the exact solution. In reducing the residual energy compared to classical uh, algorithms, some classical algorithms. And this is therefore not reaching the exact solution, it's reaching approximate solutions. So if your goal is finding approximate solutions, it may tell you that, that quantum dynamics can help reaching approximate solutions faster than classical. And I'm not claiming quantum speed or supremacy or anything, so that, that, is a, 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 that requires significantly large uh, amount of work. And one last thing I want to mention is that uh, if you increase coherence, you, will, you, will, you can increase the advantage because you can actually get more advantage of or, or get larger correlation lengths, come quantum correlations that come from uh, quantum dynamics. And for the last two uh, conclusions, I will, again, want to invite you to listen to Andrew King's uh, talk tomorrow. So with that, I want to end and invite the uh, uh, questions. Thank you for the talk. I think uh, we can proceed immediately with the questions. Hi, I mean, uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Yeah, I, I want to ask about uh, your first bullet points here. So annealing uh, faster than decoherence rates can enable coherent annealing. Uh, so, so usually decoherence rate is, uh, is only defined in the weak coupling limit or when your system uh, energy scale is, uh, is very large. So wh why do you think that we can remain in this weak coupling limit even uh, in this problem where your system minimum gap should uh, uh, close uh, polynomially with system size. And, and yes, yeah. that, uh, you can uh, calculate correlate co coherence time, the coherence time. And the coherence time is, is some time. And if you go faster than the coherence time, the environment does not have time does not have time to, to, to respond to your system. So even if the gap is small and you go faster than, than the coherence time, the, the, the environment does not have time. So, so is this decoherence time related to the single qubit decoherence or is uh, So the in this case, system? this is a, a, a good question actually. So this is a critical dynamics and you have a very narrow critical region and it is important that you be coherent during the critical region because after that the dynamics is frozen. So it is not single qubit coherent. It's actually the whole system should be coherent during this narrow critical region. And that, that's a, so because this, this uh, is a, a small fraction of the whole annealing time. So your system should be coherent in a small fraction of the total annealing time. And uh, so if you see the experimental results, so let me show you the 1D experimental result. You see that, yeah, you see here like up to, this is like 10 nanoseconds up to like 
I don't know, 20, 30, 40 nanosecond, there is no dependence on temperature. So back to my question, the environment, my, my answer, the environment does not have time to respond to, your, to, to the, the system because relaxation time is, is around this, this time. So up to this, this annealing time, which is like 30, 40, this means that if you anneal with this, with this annealing time, the system passes this, this, this uh, critical region completely coherently. That's why everything agrees very well with no free parameters. And, and I guess, like, do, do you try to study, like, where this crossover from coherent to incoherent happens as a function of system size? Can, can, or you can do that. Uh, I would say it is, I, I, I won't use coherent or incoherent. I would say, let me, uh, do you see my cursor? So you, this is a coherent regime. This is quasi a static regime. It's not incoherent. You still have single qubit coherence. You still have uh, uh, the, the spectrum agrees with, with, uh, with what you expect quantum mechanics. It's not the incoherent, every qubit is, 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 is dynamic, is incoherent. So there is a, a transition between coherent regime and quasi a static regime, and there's a transition region, and this transition region is the Kibel Zurich, uh, anti Kibel Zurich region. There's a transition region between coherent and quasi a static, which the system starts seeing the environment. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, hi, Mohammed. It's Paul Warburton here. Um, you, hi, Paul. You seem to be concluding that uh, coherence can help reduce your residual energy, which is good. Uh, but you seem to be not explicitly concluding that coherence can increase your ground state probability if you're looking for a ground state solution. C could you comment on that? Is, is that not the case? Is coherence not a way to ground state solutions? So this is, what I'm talking about is second order phase transition. What I'm saying that second, the dynamics of second order phase transition does not take you to your ground state. Because after second order phase transition, there could be first order phase transitions. You have to pass those first order phase transitions also coherently, which would be adiabatically, which could actually, there's no reason that adiabatic actually is better than diabatic. So it becomes actually a very complicated question. And uh, But what I can say right now is second order phase transition can take you to a low energy state faster than uh, the uh, I, I, I want to leave it to, 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 to tomorrow, actually. <laughs> I, I want to leave the surprise tomorrow. I want to say it is possible that if you put these numbers, calculate this, this, the critical exponents, and uh, if, you find that, if you find that this exponent x is bigger in quantum than classical, then there is a chance that that will occur. But to, we should see tomorrow what are these numbers. But just try and repeat Xi's last question, which I thought was a good question, which was, um, there's a crossover from the coherent regime to the quasi-static regime. Have you, studied right. the, have you studied the dependence of that crossover point on the length of your chain? Uh, Is that the question, Xi? <laughs> I don't think there's a dependence on the length of the chain. So I, I mean, this is, a, Andrew, is uh, Andrew King was, Involved. I don't think we, we did. It depends. So the, if you are very small, if the chain is very small, uh, is Andrew there? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. So, um, yes. uh, can can you rephrase the question? So, so l l let me just let me just say what I've inferred. The question is: uh, Can you see can you see a size dependent crossover between the Kibble Zurich regime and the uh, Landau Zener regime? Uh, and the answer no, is no. No, the, the question is Andrew. The question was: Can you see crossover to thermal regime as a function of size? And I, I don't think there was. Uh, there is a size dependent crossover to the exponential scaling of the Landau Zener regime. Um, which is coherent. Yeah, which is which is, has nothing to do with open system, um, but I don't I don't think that there. I mean, 
the, these two kind of um, they they play against each other. There's a there's a there's a competition between the thermal excitations and the 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 size in that sense. So you would see. I, I can show you data actually, um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll have time to show it tomorrow, but I can show it to you today. I have a question, can I ask? Sure. Uh, so uh, in slide number 44, uh, there you see, uh, say that whatever be the size of the kink, the energy cost of every kink is two times J. Why is it the case? Because every kink, so you want to minimize the, the energy and you want to satisfy every term in the Hamiltonian. So every kink means that the, the neighboring uh, spins are not aligned, which means the, 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 the J, you get 2J instead of J uh, times S times S, instead of being plus one becomes minus one. So you get two two J's difference between whether the kink is satisfied or the kink, whether the, the coupling is satisfied or coupling is not satisfied. Oh, okay, that way. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for the, for the talk. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you cannot simulate um, quantum and uh, quantum Monte Carlo currently. Um, I used to think that, for example, if you use Pathero Monte Carlo, it's due to like topological obstructions that you might not always simulate the quantum engineering because there were some results, I think by Glenn and, and Giuseppe, on the quantumism chain where they studied the density of the kings and they showed that it goes like one over the square root of the annealing time. So that looks like they are simulating current quantum annealing, but will you call that like quasi-static regime or how will you differentiate those results from current quantum annealing? Thanks. So yeah, I, actually, very good question. Very good question. I, I, I uh, so for one D, uh, indeed, uh, some of the dynamic because the square root time is is uh, also diffusion. So if you have diffusion, you will get also length going as a square root of time. So some of the, the, the algorithms that you, if you run and, and just, just blindly look at the scaling, it gives you a square root of time. But none of them can generate all the aspects of, so in, in the paper, I, I uh, so in this paper, if you, if you go and search, we actually study quantum Monte Carlo, simulated annealing, a spin vector Monte Carlo, and none of them can generate all the aspects of the, the uh, uh, coherent annealing, especially when your ch chain size uh, is small and you get Landau in your transition, adiabatic quantum computation, none of them can get exactly what we get. So, so if, if you, there is something stimulating, it should stimulate in all regimes. But you are right, uh, it, it can give you actually a square root of time, uh, even similar to any can you give a square root of time. But even a square root of time, it doesn't give you, so here we, we're not only claiming we get a square root of time. We are also claiming that the, the prefactor it gives is exactly, I mean, very nice agreement prefactor with exact solutions. Uh, and this can you cannot get with, with uh, those algorithms. So, so I think it, it's enough evidence that the system is following the coherent annealing and not uh, quantum Monte Carlo dynamics. So thanks for the nice talk. Um, I guess you, you kind of backed off from this question of uh, a quantum advantage, but I mean, if, if you ask the question, if you, know, you design hardware, would you prefer it to be operating in the classical regime or a quantum regime? You know, the, if, if it performs better in the quantum regime, would, from some respects, you know, that would be a form of advantage. Um, but I guess, I, what, what makes you hesitate to really kind of say it? You want to put it within a larger computational structure and then rule out all classical competitors? Or uh, first of all, I'm not showing the data in more than one D. One D. So I will refer to the uh, 
Andrew King's talk tomorrow. This was just an opening for his talk. <laughs> so he will, he, will, he will show more data in the 3D spin glass, actually. So that, that's one thing. What I mentioned was this work and the work of Andrew King tomorrow is all about second order phase transition. And we cannot claim further than second order phase transition. And second order phase transition does not take you to the ground state. It just takes you a, to a good low energy solution. That's what I, I, I mentioned. If you want to do the go to uh, exact result, then you have to deal with first order phase transitions as well. And that's a totally different story. Again, I, uh, hopefully in the future we have coherent enough system that we can also address that. Hi, Mohammed. Viv Kendon here. Um, so this is uh, looking at the dynamics of phase transitions. Is I'm just thinking about the physics now, um, and I'm thinking back, way back, and I'd, ha I'd have to dig in the archive of my records to find the papers that are, are on this. If when you look at when you actually do experiments, say on real materials, think about having that. Um, you know, you're changing the the bulk, say that, say the transverse field in, you know, and macroscopically across your sample, it's in practice, you're not uniform everywhere. Um, and so the phase transition is not at exactly the same point everywhere in your system. Um, do you think you can study that with um, the setup you have, or have you seen any evidence of that? Um, because that, the actual dynamics you then get for how the transition proceeds is not just the speed of the sweep, but it's also the homogeneity of it. And you can push it from one side to the other if you're, you've got a slight gradient on your magnetic field, if you like. Uh, yes. Uh, indeed, in our annealing system, uh, we can actually tune transfer field per qubit and by hand generate this order that you, you mentioned. You can, you can generate this order in, in J's and you can also generate this order in gamma in, in the tunneling. And, but in these systems, because we wanted to, to, to simplify things as much as possible to use the knowledge of the critical phenomena, Andrew actually went, uh, spent a lot of time to homogenize the system. So it's about exactly the opposite. We tried so hard to homogenize the system to get to get the result that that agree with uh, what you would expect in homogeneous systems. But uh, in principle, yes, we can actually make it inhomogeneous and and and, and uh, see the result of inhomogeneity. Okay. Are there any other question? Is there any other question? I actually have another question. Yes, please. In um, so uh, we have seen uh, that we, we have been doing some spin coherent state path integral with um, uh, this quantum annealing and we saw that when this mini gap appears, then our system goes into a mini body localized phase. In that case, can we perform first order phase transition when our system is in the many body localized phase by introducing disorder or by whatever uh, maybe anti kibbutzurek mechanism, some kind, uh, so some way inducing that, uh, bring our system uh, closer to the true optimum or to the true ground state? So, uh, for me, many body localization and this is uh, entering the spin glass phase is the same thing, uh, but looking at it from different uh, angles. So, uh, what I showed was that you enter from paramagnetic into a spin glass phase. And what happens in this, you can think about phase, second order phase transition. If you average over many, many, uh, the many, many realization of this order, or if you look at it, an individual system, you can say, oh, this is a many body localization. As, as you, it's the same thing. Uh, I didn't get your question. So you're saying you, how you can go through the, the second, first of the phase transitions after, yeah. after, after many body. Yeah. So 
first order phase transitions are harder beasts to deal with, I, I, would, I would say. Uh, what, is, what has been clear to us and to many researchers that adiabatic evolution is not the answer because the gap is extremely small and adiabatic, if you want to avoid adiabatic, it becomes very, very slow and exponentially slow and then maybe. So there are suggestions that if you do diabatic evolution to uh, many body, uh, first order phase transition, you may get some, some probital excitation before reaching the anticoagulant and solve the problem faster. Uh, there's also an, uh, a paper we have uh, which we actually show that temperature also helps because it also does the same thing. It actually excites the system to, to the solution uh, before the anticoagulant. But I, uh, from the perspective the perspective of experiment, we haven't reached the coherence time that we actually get to these points coherently, and, and uh, so I don't, I cannot answer you from our experimental results, but we now have coherence during second order phase transition. Thank you. Okay, we can thank again Professor Amin for his talk.